It is the early hours of the 2nd of May 2018, and emergency workers are sifting through the rubble of a high-rise tower. Over the space of just 80 minutes, a landmark building on the Sao Paulo skyline has gone. As the full scale of the collapse unfolds, multiple people are missing. It is feared that their lives have been lost. What's bizarre is that the building was made of steel and concrete and the cause of the disaster is looking like a fire. Welcome to Plenty Difficult, my name is John and today we're looking at the Wilton Paes de Almeida building disaster. Background This is the Wilton Paes de Almeida building. It was somewhat of a trailblazer in Brazilian skyscraper design. Originally penned and planned in the early 1960s, the building had a stunning glass facade, hiding its steel and concrete structure, a first somewhat for Brazil. The building had a steel and concrete core section, which housed the lift shafts and central staircase. In addition to the central core, the building had just four supporting columns made of steel and concrete. These columns were sighted inbound from the tower's exterior glass facade. Around the core and columns, ribbed concrete floors were installed, with outer areas of the building having a cantilever arrangement. The design provided a very open and flexible space, which when combined with the glass facade made it a very light and potentially hot environment for its interior. Because of this, right from the architect's pen, air conditioning would be built into the structure's very being. The floors had spaces for air conditioning ducting built into them, allowing for the system to be well hidden. On top of maintaining a good temperature, the aircon system helped keep the vast sections of glass demisted. Now, that impressive glass facade made use of the thin ends of the floor slabs for its equally dainty aluminium frames. The building, when looking at pictures of it in its heyday, are very impressive. But the building's unique selling point offered little in the way of structural strength. But it wasn't really intended to. The building was constructed between 1961 and 1968 by a company called Morse and Berenbach for its first owner, Sebastio Paris de Media, who rented out parts of the building's 26 floors to various companies in the country. The main occupant was the Commercial Glass Company of Brazil, with offices from the Bank Caxa Economica Federal on the ground floor. The main entrance had marble imported from Greece for finishing the floors. Once opened, the building had a street address of 22 Rua Antonio de Godi, next to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Sao Paulo. Interestingly, the building took its name in honouring Sebastião's older brother. At the time of its opening, there was nothing else really like it in the surrounding area. The building would be taken over by the government due to reportedly unpaid debts. As such, Sao Paulo police and the Brazilian Social Security took over the building to make it their headquarters. In 1992, the historical significance of the building was recognised by listing it on the preservation of the historical, cultural and environmental heritage of the city of Sao Paulo. However, during its government use, the building was altered, but not really modernised or significantly refurbished. The place as a significant landmark wouldn't do much for the building's state of repair, as in 2003 it would find itself abandoned. Originally it was planned to become a cultural centre post-government use, but these plans fell through. It probably wouldn't shock anyone if I say, after being left empty for a while, the building would begin to show its signs of age. It wasn't getting the necessary maintenance, and soon enough the structure would see new inhabitants. Much like any semi-habitable empty building anywhere in the world, it became a target for squatters. Now, I need to add a note here, as there are somewhat conflicting reports as to how the new occupants came to be living inside the tower. Some have said it was a government program, others have said it was completely illegal. But what is widely agreed upon was that a lot of people that were living in the tower were families. Not the kind of squatters who are doing it just for fun, but desperate people in hard times. The squat was run by the Movement for Social Struggle for Housing, 
in which each resident paid the organization a small fee for rent. As noted in the LA Times, the government tolerated such squats, with as many as 70 buildings in downtown Sao Paulo being taken over as such. During this time, the building rapidly saw a decline with graffiti lacing exterior and trash mounting up within. Makeshift structures made of scrap wood were built to divide different families over the various levels. The lifts had been taken out of the shafts after the building was abandoned, and generally the building was damaged with flooded areas and broken windows. The vacant space for the lifts ended up being used as a kind of waste disposal chute, except when it reached the ground floor, no one collected the rubbish, leaving it to pile up. On top of this, electricity to the building was unreliable, resulting in a few homemade hack jobs of unprotected electrical wiring, as reported in the LA Times by siphoning off of nearby streetlights. The building was put up for sale in 2015, and by 2018, local authorities decided it was time to clear out the tower. Multiple meetings were held between officials and residents where they were told to leave or face legal proceedings. This was between February and April 2018, but, well, the building wouldn't need clearing out for much longer. Whilst we're in Brazil for this week's video, let me show you this article about the Amazon rainforest that I found on ground.news slash plainly difficult. But what is ground news, I hear you asking? Well, ground news is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world that we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard to verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivized click generating news sources. It does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 news sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets, and importantly, their political biases. Let's have a look at how it works. Let's take a look at this article. Deforestation in Brazil's Amazon rainforest is down to lowest level since 2016, government says. It's been covered by 54 news sources with a 50% lean to the left and only an 8% lean to the right. If you scroll down, you can see all the articles, like this one by NBC, which is on the left and says, Deforestation in Brazil's Amazon rainforest down to lowest level since 2016, government says. However, this right-leaning article from Le Parisien mentions that the deforestation has actually slightly increased. Brazil, deforestation in the Amazon increased in July, a first in 15 months. Interestingly, I found this article on my blind spot feed. This feature I find really useful for seeing news stories that I may not have seen before. Due to them being reported more strongly on one side of the political spectrum, or the other. I have the Vantage plan, and if it interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing really important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, let's get on to the disaster. The disaster. It is the early hours of the morning of the 1st of May 2018, and a fire has just erupted on the 5th floor of the Wilton Pasadena Media building. Now, the cause of the fire is disputed. The likely cause is of a short circuit in the dodgy wiring used throughout the building. But others have reported it was caused by an argument that ended up with someone being covered in alcohol and a lit match being thrown at him. Regardless, the fire was in the perfect place for it to spread. Quickly, it burned the wood and cardboard dividing walls, and with the elevator shafts being empty, the flame spread both upwards and down throughout the structure. This was at roughly 1.30 in the morning. The flames and smoke woke up many of the tower's residents, who began escaping via the main staircase. Smoke quickly enveloped the tower, and flames rapidly spread, engulfing almost every floor from the roof, to the entrance lobby. The glass facade in the heat popped its panels, showering the street below with shards. The height of the building meant that the flames could be seen for miles. As such, many took to the streets to observe the inferno. Emergency services started arriving and began the unenviable task of trying to battle the flames. Emergency workers assisted in evacuating the tower. During this time, the flames spread to an adjacent building, but time was running out. 
At around 2.50 in the morning, the building suddenly collapsed. In just a matter of seconds, the building smashed into the ground, spreading out steel, concrete and fire out into the street. The church next door to the tower was destroyed by the falling rubble. There were many people still inside the building when it collapsed. As said in the New York Times, a person was trapped on an upper floor and was calling for help when the building collapsed. And it is very likely that this person was killed. Around 160 firefighters will be dispatched to the tower and its rubble pile to extinguish the fire and dig out any bodies or survivors. By the afternoon, the burning rubble had been reduced to smouldering hotspots. The disaster angered many as it became a symbol for the terrible housing situation in the city. Aftermath The smouldering rubble was picked over by rescue workers and bodies would be pulled out from the rubble. But by two weeks post-collapse and still at least four people missing, the search was called off. In total, at least seven people died in the collapse, although the number isn't certain as registration of residents wasn't really done in the tower and thus its occupants number wasn't really fully known. Many, many more were injured and several hundred were displaced. As such, much of the tower's now homeless residents were forced into sleeping on the street or into tents. I mentioned earlier about the collapse generating anger in the local community. This would spill out to the president, as reported in the New York Times. President Mikhail Temer, who was in Sao Paulo for the May Day holiday, visited the wreckage Tuesday morning, but left quickly after local residents turned on him in anger. Eventually, the rubble and remains were cleared up and shipped off for disposal. But how did the building collapse? As steel and concrete traditionally have been thought to be pretty impervious to fire. Well, this isn't a case of just black and white, and it's more of a maybe. You see, like any building, for it to perform as safely as possible, it requires maintenance, regular inspections and remedial work as soon as an issue arises. Something very unlikely in an abandoned building. The biggest issue for the Wilton Pasadena Media building was the type of fire. You see, burning wood can get up to temperatures in excess of 600 degrees Celsius. The fire burned out of control for just over an hour with a chimney effect due to the empty lift shafts. This, although not melting the steel, was enough to make it expand. In the aftermath, an investigation was conducted by Paolo Helene, as well as others in their paper. It went into testing the rebar on the concrete. Interestingly, the materials used in the building were deemed to be of good quality and rebar spacing within the columns were seen to be acceptable, at least in the samples collected. It all seemed pretty good for a building built in the 1960s. So how did it collapse then? Well, the design of the building would ultimately be the cause. The central core and the four columns arrangement created an asymmetric structure and although well designed for gravitational loads, the building could be susceptible to lateral movement. However, the building was strong enough to resist stresses from wind, but not the extra stress from expansion of the building's components due to the fire, as noted in Paolo Helenes' paper. The structural model associated with the calculation thermal loads effects for the temperature gradient of 250 degrees C showed that torsional movements due to thermal expansions of the structural elements are about 20 times higher than those due to wind loads and vertical loads. This ended up making the building twist, which after enough force ended up in the progressive structural collapse that we saw. Basically the building just twisted itself to pieces, and thus the world experienced yet another steel and concrete building failure due to fire, which will lead me on to a future video, the Windsor Tower collapse in Madrid. So that's my video on the subject. I'm going to give it a free on the scale and this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plenty of Thought production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plenty of Thought videos are produced by me, John, in a currently sunburningly hot corner of Southern London, UK. I have Instagram and a second YouTube channel to so check them out if you fancy watching other bits and pieces and I'd like to say a very warm thank you to my YouTube and Patreon members for your financial support as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch my dodgy cartoons and all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching and Mr Music play us out please <laughs>